So hopefully that was a fairly light and non-technical introduction to some of the ideas or main, the main idea that goes into gauge theories, which is gauge invariance. So I've hopefully been able to convince you that basically all physical theories should be gauge theories because, well, physics has to be gauge invariant. So now let's dive a little bit deeper and look at some of the technology which we use to formulate gauge theories. So I'm going to discuss the groupoid perspective for gauge fields. So I've been deliberately kind of vague about what gauge fields are, as I'm obviously not going to be able to formulate them fully when talking about principal bundles, but essentially whatever a gauge field is, it's going to have to live in some kind of space, or traditionally we would think of this as being a set. So let's just forget about gauge fields for a minute and just think about classical field theories. We would say have some collection of all of our classical fields, which I can call big curly F, and then here are our fields. They could just be scalar fields or vector fields, whatever you want. They're classical fields, they're not gauge fields. They just simply live in a set, the collection of all fields. So this might be phi, phi 1, phi 2, etc. So this is a set of fields. Now because this is just a simple set, so not groupoid, this is a set. We can use the set theoretical relation, which is the equals sign. This is a logical statement, it's true if A equals B. Now we can just simply use the equals relation on the set to ask, is phi1 the same field as phi2, for example? So we can ask this question, Because we're simply dealing with a set, we can just compare the elements using this equals sum. So this is all fine for classical fields, we can simply just lump them together as elements of a set. But now when we start considering gauge fields, things become a lot more complicated. So I'll just redraw this picture again. But now instead of but now instead of classical fields, I'm gonna have gauge fields. So again, this is our collection of fields, I might give it a hat to distinguish that they're different from this set of classical fields. So we're going to have now gauge fields, start calling my gauge fields A, so that would be A1, A2, A3. So at the moment this is still just a set, it's just a set of our gauge fields, but if you actually remember from the last video I said we not only need to specify the gauge fields, we also need to specify the gauge transformations. So we have all of our gauge fields and we know gauge fields are going to be related by gauge transformations. So as well as giving you this set of gauge fields, I need to also give you all of the possible transformations. So we could have say a gauge transformation between A1 and A2 and then equally one back again. And then we might also have some other more complicated kind of non-trivial gauge transformations of a gauge field even to itself. And there'll be other, all the other possible arrows which I could draw here, I'm not going to draw all of them. So now we need to realise something, this object which I've drawn here no longer has the structure of a set. I can't ask, is A1 equal to A2? Because essentially this question is no longer asked by the set, rather the question is A1 equal to A2 is now asked by providing the gauge transformation between them. So essentially now we should realise we can't have an equal sign in this new object, which I'm now going to call a groupoid, this is a groupoid. We can't ask the question, are two gauge fields equal to each other? We can only ask, are they equivalent to each other, given a gauge transformation? So I can instead write, A is now gauge transform with some gauge transformation, I'll call it G. So this one here might be G12, this one G21, and then this one G 
three, three, where the superscripts are labeling where I'm going to and from. So now rather than just a set, we have this new object, which is a groupoid. I'll explain a little bit more what a groupoid is shortly. But for now, we should, the key point we need to realize is that we can't use a quality that's a structure on sets. We can only ask our two things now equivalent up to gauge transformations. So essentially equals has been replaced by a gauge transformation. So this is now wildly important structure that we need to take into account. We can't use normal kind of set language. We have to work in the, the category of groupoids rather than the category of sets. So this F is known as a one groupoid or just a groupoid. And now what a groupoid essentially is, is so if we, we think of a group as being the set, the set of transformations or symmetry transformations that acts on a single object, the groupoid is now that same group but acting on a collection of objects. So all of these G's which I'm writing are going to be elements of some group. It's going to be a Lie group, but we'll just call it the group for now. So the G's, which are the gauge transformations, are group elements. And then this group, our symmetry group, acts on the collection of fields. And how it's able to do this is we're packaging the structure, or we're packaging our uh, collection of fields in the kind of groupoid language. So I've just drawn pictures to represent the groupoid. How do we write this in more mathematical notation? Well, we simply specify that the groupoid, which I've called f hat, f hat as an object is now given by, so as I've said, we need to specify two things. We need to specify first the objects, which are the gauge fields. So I'm calling them A, I'm indexing them with an I. And then we need to specify the objects of the groupoid and now what's known as morphisms, essentially the transformations between the elements of the groupoid. So objects are gauge fields, then morphisms are obviously gauge transformations. So this, which I've now written down, is how you would formally give me the information of this groupoid, the groupoid of gauge fields. Okay, so this is just now kind of introduction to the sum of the machinery which we're going to use. Now this is kind of this groupoid perspective is actually relatively new in, in physics. We were hadn't kind of formulated gauge theories in this sort of categorical language until fairly recently. It was completely new to me and my supervisor introduced it to me. But it actually makes a lot of constructions now very natural and very, very rigorously defined as well. And I mentioned here that this is a one groupoid. We can potentially now consider Okay, we've got our set of gauge fields. We've also got our gauge transformations. Well, what about gauge transformations of gauge transformations? I could consider a gauge field where I transform back and forth with a pair of gauge transformations. But these gauge transformations, they're just group elements. They could in principle act on that group element with another group element add in, say, some G prime. Now I'm not only considering a one groupoid, but I'm considering a two groupoid. And you can, in principle, consider as many gauge transformations, of gauge transformations as you like, all the way up to uh, what's known as an infinity groupoid. This is now very kind of stepping into the, the realms of category theory that I don't want to go any further into, but in principle, we can consider structures all the way up to an infinity groupoid, and this has to be done to do this uh, fully rigorously. But for our purposes, a one groupoid is enough. We simply need to consider gauge fields and gauge transformations. So now, if you're familiar with any group theory, you might now be wondering, well, is this groupoid even necessary? Could we not instead simply just say, so rather than just giving you the set of all the gauge fields and all their transformations, is it not just enough to simply consider all the gauge fields that are 
equivalent of the gauge transformations. So the structure of that would form an equivalence class. So you would essentially define the equivalence relation using the gauge transformation. You would say that if this gauge transformation exists, then A1 is equivalent to A2. This is the symbol for an equivalence relation. I could put a G to remind us that it's gauge equivalence. So we could form what, what's known as the gauge orbit space. Essentially, it's just the equivalence class of all gauge fields which are gauge equivalent. So that's simply just going to be now a set looking at these objects and only seeing the objects which are equivalent under gauge transformations. This, this is okay. You can use the gauge orbit space, and this is what physicists were usually using before the groupoid structure was identified. However, if we consider this loop in the groupoid, and we ask what's the equivalence class of this loop, well, we're just going to simply effectively lose this information that's captured in this G33, because under the equivalence class, all we're going to see is this A3. We're not going to see that it's being gauge transformed to itself. Now, this is all kind of getting a bit technical, but we need this kind of higher order information that's, that would be lost if we simply form the equivalence class. Or we, if we were just looking at a set of all the gauge fields which are equivalent, we're essentially just going to see one object, just the zero gauge field. We kind of need all of this extra information specified by all the gauge fields and all their transformations. And this can only be captured by using the groupoid structure. So I'm still being deliberately vague about what these gauge fields actually are. We're going to see that they're going to be represented by connections in principal bundles. But for now, we're just going to leave them as abstract objects that are related by gauge transformations. So in summary then, we not only need the structure of a set to talk about gauge fields, but we need the structure of a groupoid because essentially we need to capture this extra information that comes from the morphisms. And I briefly mentioned how it's, it would be kind of okay to just simply consider the gauge orbit space or the set of all gauge fields which are gauge equivalent, but then you're going to lose information such as how a gauge field is transformed to itself. Because essentially a gauge field is always equivalent to itself. You might as well have not done the gauge transformation. So you're losing that information essentially. So we need the structure of a groupoid in order to capture all of the information specified by the gauge fields, not only the gauge fields, but all of the possible gauge transformations. And this can all be neatly packaged into this groupoid object which is kind of a categorical object, but it can be kind of visualized in this simple way. It's simply a set of objects which transform under the action of some symmetry group, which is what the morphisms are telling us. So hopefully now I've gone over enough of the kind of background structure that we're going to need to actually introduce the idea of edge modes. So that will hopefully be the next video.